Hi there, my name is Renee Hobbs and welcome to this special <laughs> webinar on film exhibition and licensing in public libraries. Um, today I am joined by an amazing group of panel members who are going to give us a, some insight on the, um, the power and the opportunity of using independent film in the public library context. Um, so for about the next 60 minutes, uh, I, I hope that you're um, prepared to uh, be enlightened and inspired and actually learn a lot too. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our panelists and I'm going to actually uh, let them introduce themselves. Uh, so first we'll hear from Anissa and Eric. Yeah, unmute us. Hi, <laughs> little technical difficulties. Um, I'm Anise Roof, and I'm the executive director of the Providence Children's Film Festival. Um, and we present the best of independent and international cinema here in Rhode Island through our annual festival in February for kids. And then we also do some programming throughout the year. And Eric Bilodeau, Director of Programming for that film festival. And Eric, and Eric, what's your job as Director of Programming? Help us understand what that job is. Uh, basically to um, find films and also to set up a, a submission uh, platform which where filmmakers can submit their films directly to the film festival um, and uh, try to be a part of it. So kind of a mix between finding films and having filmmakers find us. Nice. Thanks for sharing. Uh, now I want to introduce Eugene Martin. Uh, Eugene, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm, the, I'm an independent filmmaker, and I'm the chair of the Department of Media Arts at the University of North Texas. Um, but primarily, I consider myself a feature filmmaker. I've made 10 feature-length films, mostly about children and at-risk youth. A lot of my films have been released internationally. Um, and pretty widely across uh, television, libraries, um, digital streaming platforms such as Netflix and iTunes. And so I'm in a constant conversation about how my work, even before I begin production, can have an audience impact um, and how it can become, how I can find an audience and aggregate that audience. So I think this conversation is incredibly relevant for not only people such as myself, but for librarians and users to understand the motivations for filmmakers and how to also how young people really want to engage with filmmakers are very interested in the process of developing stories and then sharing those stories. Eugene, one of the most powerful films you've made recently is called The Anderson Monarchs. Can you tell us a little bit about that film and how that film is relevant uh, to uh, uh, our interest today in screenings in public libraries? Yeah, I think so. The Anderson Monarchs is about a young group of 10 and 13 year old African American girls who play soccer in the inner city in Philadelphia and it follows them over a three or four years and the film really isn't about soccer, it's about the development of youth um, in a community and how that how that, their development impacts the community um, in just incredible ways that are so often overlooked and one of the unique things about the film is that it's really voiced from the point of view of the children, um, which was a very delicate process. And the film has had tremendous success in reaching a lot of um, African American audiences internationally um, through television, through the Aspire TV network, through Hallmark Channel, through Netflix and iTunes and, and Amazon Prime, all of these venues and the feedback. I've, I've, I've traveled around the country and I've met people that have seen the film and are just very moved by it. And so for me, the film didn't really make very much money, but I got the biggest audience for any motion picture I've ever made. Um, and so it's been very fulfilling for me to, to be able to now I can go back into these audiences. And I've also, I also did some conference presentations at the U.S. Youth Soccer Club and in London, the Women's National Football Olympic team in London really loves the movie. So what I found is that women from around the world could relate to the story because they all kind of had similar beginnings because actually, ironically, the United States is the only country where soccer doesn't come from cities. Everywhere else in the world, soccer comes from cities, not from suburbs. Here it's the opposite. So right now the film's going to be screening in Barcelona 
um, at a festival later this year. So again, over and over, I keep finding that if you've got a film that has a, a kind of a universal storyline, whether it's about youth or community or empowerment, it really has an evergreen status, you know. So the only thing that I could say that I did was I, I kept the timeline of the film kind of clean because um, I wanted it to be able to have a long life. And I think the educational setting was always in my mind mm -hmm. as I was making the film and constructing it for an audience. Nice. Thanks so much for sharing. That gives us a better understanding of the kind of work you do and its relevance to the community uh, and library context. Uh, Katie, welcome to our webinar. And uh, you, You're waking up super early this morning to participate in this, so we're grateful to you. Please introduce yeah. yourself to our audience. Okay, hi. I'm uh, Katie Irons from the Pierce, Pierce County, County Library. Library. I um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting a really weird echo. Um, I, uh, I've been working for the Pierce County Library for about 17 years now. I'm the audiovisual collection development uh, librarian here, which means I choose the items that are in our branches. Um, I also wrote the book um, Film Programming for Public Libraries, and a lot of that came out of my uh, role as the person for my system who manages our film licenses. So. I um, I work with our branches to understand uh, how the licenses work, how they can figure out what movies are okay for them to show. I also um, sometimes if they come to me with a a film that isn't covered by our license, I work to try and figure out how we could show it possibly. Um, I try not to be the person who says no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's my that's my background and how I came to be here. I think, um, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. We're we're so glad you're here. Thanks so much for joining and sharing your expertise with us. And now I'd like to and introduce like Leah Lumen. Leah, Lumen. Can, you Leah can, you, can you introduce yourself? You introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Leah Lubman. Um, I work with Providence Community Libraries. Uh, prior to this, I also worked as a middle and high school librarian and have had a very long investment in connecting people to all different types of media. I'm now working on managing the StoryCorps at your library's campaign. We were one of 10 libraries selected in the country this year out of over 300. So that's been another interesting and exciting piece about connecting media to people of all ages and all backgrounds. Um, so I'm here today really just to chime in about why um, we were why we connect to our youth and our um, adult community to larger media programs and film and what's the importance of that and how does that um, look different from maybe things like print media nice thanks nice. Thanks, thanks, so thanks so much for sharing, so much for sharing. Uh, okay so we're going to start at the top with uh, the first with, uh, question uh, the first question to you Eugene to you Eugene so how do independent so how filmmakers, do make filmmakers make money how are independent how are films independent films financed and financed distributed and distributed all right so all right. so um, can you guys hear me okay yeah um, so I think basically, you know, the financing is pretty tricky because you have to have a lot of patience basically knowing that you're not really going to get paid <laughs> uh, maybe until the film is finished. And so part of the reason why people like myself become professors is because you need to have a sustainable way to be a working artist. And um, the Academy has really risen to the occasion to understand now how to bring in people like me into the academy, how to tenure me, um, and how to give us support, um, basically with the gift of time. You know, because it used to be, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, you could be a filmmaker and sell a few hundred copies of your movie to a distributor, and that would make enough money with the licensing fees. Now, it's, it's completely different because physical media is going away, and the distributors that do physical media charge an upfront fee and they sort of expense you. So I guess in 2003 I had a film that was at Sundance called Diary of a City Priest. It had multiple distributors, an international distributor, and the film made about a quarter million dollars internationally, of which I saw zero. 
And then I had a library licensing deal, and it sold to 300 libraries, and it grossed to $80,000, and again, I made zero. So the film probably grossed a third of a million dollars, and as the filmmaker, I saw zero dollars. So, you know, flash forward 10, 15 years, and now streaming is part of the thing, and I've got four films in distribution now uh, through various networks, and the amount of money is really low, but the amount of audience is really high. And so it's really, it, so it really then goes back to, okay, it's kind of settled in there. It's not hard to get your films released, but it's incredibly hard to make money. And I'm even hearing grant, some grant agencies want you to pay yourself while you're filming. Others say, hey, don't pay yourself while you're filming because we can't give you enough money. And so it's a terrible conundrum that places people who are trying to be creative and, and have a sustainable lifestyle, it makes it almost impossible to, to do that on its own, unless you're a superstar like an Alex Gibney or a Barbara Koppel or, um, you know, or you have an HBO deal because even PBS, like ITVS, they're only funding the end game now. When you sign a contract with ITVS, they pretty much want the film delivered within 12 months which means that you're no longer filming, you're just delivering an editorial process. And so the editor is the person that's going to make the most money because they'll want you to hire an Academy Award nominated editor in the Guild and they'll make about ninety dollars to $120,000 a year with their salary and benefits. So say if they give you two fifty, dollars half of it's going to go to the editor and the other half will go to licenses. And you may not even be able to afford licensing stock footage and music beyond the Americas. So I've, I've known filmmakers that have made incredible films but could only afford short-term licenses because the PBS funding will only cover the U.S. rights, not the world rights. And obviously, streaming requires international rights. And so as an educator, one of the things that I'm doing is telling students to have everything that you incorporate into your motion picture or documentary cleared. Every, every release form, every piece of music, every piece of artwork, every location, so that you can get errors and omissions insurance so you can deliver your movie. I mean, there's a lot of filmmakers that make films that can't be delivered, and that's really a waste of resources. Um, I would like to see libraries become easier partners for individuals. A lot of the digital platforms only work with what's called aggregators. I, as an individual, cannot go to Netflix, but through Sundance Artist Services, through uh, various companies like The Orchard and um, other places, you can go through their aggregation system. But Netflix only pays around three or $4,000 for an independent film. You know, they don't pay that much. Um, and if your film doesn't get enough hits in a year, they drop it. So Netflix is, a, is considered a studio release, but and it's very prestigious and everybody knows it, but it's very hard to make your film last on that platform. So I do think that placement in libraries is going to come back around and be very, very significant for independent filmmakers. But again, the libraries would have to get used to dealing with individuals and they might have the staff to do that. So they'll turn to the aggregators, which are now the distributors like Bullfrog and California Newsreel and New Day Films, some of the smaller places. Um, and they're getting overwhelmed with submissions. So they're taking fewer titles. And if the titles don't fit into their catalog, then if you don't have a California Newsreel title, it's not going to work you know, in there, but they're an excellent distributor. So there's some, and also a lot of the people that were in the business aren't in the business. So you sign these contracts and then three years later they're out of business. And so in some way, I know filmmakers now just going to Vimeo on demand. So you've got major, major independent filmmakers going to these direct channels. Um, and, and, and again, it's with mixed success because you're there, but who knows that you're there? Mm. And, you know, the Internet is all about the new. So when you put a page up and you don't change it, no one's going to go back. Right. And you can only tweet so much. Right. So it's really, it really is a conundrum, I think. Um, and, it's, and it's a challenge. I mean, also as an educator, one of the things that I'm doing is really, in, we have an MFA program in documentary, is getting them to think about for their thesis film, who's their audience going to be, and build it out that way. Versus make a film to make a film. After a, you can only do that so many times. You can only ask your parents for money so many times before you're going to run out. And also, funders want to see that your film doesn't necessarily have a return, but it has a, a campaign behind it. You know, I would say that 
probably 30 to 50 percent of funding for documentary now is really on the distribution side. So they don't care how you get there for your movie, they care about how you're going to use your movie. And I've had a lot of exposure with the BritDoc Film Foundation and Good Pitch going to Tribeca. And there are a lot of ideas going on about that, but there's still very limited possibilities for income. And so again, it's always pushing the rock up the hill. Every film is pushing the rock up the hill. Unless you're, it makes people like Fred Wiseman look like a genius who never, he did it all himself. You know, in some ways that was the smart way to go, but not everybody has that capacity to do that or that patience. You know, Eugene, one of the things that's interesting about what you just shared with us is it really helps us understand the incredible, um, the incredible drive to create mm -hmm. in the face of all of these obstacles uh, and all these challenges that filmmakers still find a way to get their uh, work made. And it also, your, your observations also give us a lot of interesting ways to think maybe about the future, about how um, collaborations between filmmakers and uh, libraries might advance. Uh, so you've given us a lot to, uh, to chew on. Now I want to turn to Eric and Anissa. We've, we've got the filmmaker's point of view on the challenges of uh, finding an audience and making a film, uh, especially in the context of independent work. Uh, Eric and Anissa, how do film festivals find and select um, films to show in festivals? We we use a number of different ways. Um, we, we have submissions, so submissions open in June, and we articulate what it is that we're looking for, which are films that we think are appropriate for youth, not necessarily made for youth. We invite all kinds of films, animation, documentary, and live action to be submitted. Um, but we also visit other film festivals that are happening, um, and we also look at what other film festivals are showing. <laughs> We really use um, our lens of what we're looking for in a film, of what we think will be relevant to kids of all ages. Um, and we also think about films that, you know, we're going to speak to children on different levels and also how we can pair them with a conversation and thinking about beyond the film. So we also think it's really important that the film has relevance and whether it's a director that's coming or pairing it with some other opportunity, we, we think of that when we're also looking for films. And, and, and Eric, I'm hoping you can help us understand, we know that there's more than uh, 3,000 film festivals uh, around the world every year. Uh, how do filmmakers find out about the Providence Children's Film Festival? Um, and what might motivate them to uh, submit and then help us understand a little bit about what are the um, what's the financial arrangement between the filmmaker and the film festival. Well, it's a um, uh, Eugene's story is actually I completely uh, feel his pain. I hear the uh, uh, the filmmakers. I, I deal with them in a direct way when they submit to our film festival, and they hear the stories of they're trying to sell their film. The bottom line is. Uh, and I don't mean to speak for Eugene, but I kind of pulled this, teased this out of what he was saying. They want their stories heard. I mean, this is a powerful storytelling tool, and and if they're good at their craft, it can be a very powerful storytelling. Okay, you guys have just frozen up on me for some reason. So let's just see about that. What? We're going to see how we get you back, but right now I can't, I'm not seeing you, so that's a problem. So, so ping me again when you're back, all right, because somehow you guys have frozen out. Um, uh, Katie, it's up to you and I to talk a little bit about the issues of uh, film licensing uh, and what constitutes the lawful use of film exhibition in public libraries and how is this different from school libraries. Um, one thing for sure... One thing oh. for sure. Oh, are you back? We are back. Sorry. Ah. Oh, we great. Keep, <laughs> we keep flipping out. Sorry. Ah, it's a bandwidth issue. No problem. It happens all the time. Uh, okay. So back to you, Eric. Uh, what's the relationship between the filmmaker and the uh, film festival in terms of the financial and, and the exhibition licensing issues? 
You bet. Um, so with, uh, uh, every every story, ca every film has its own story when it comes to licensing or getting permission of the filmmaker. Um, some uh, some filmmakers are very eager to get their stories t uh, told and uh, films shown by uh, offering, you know, not asking for an exhibition fee, or not uh, or not putting limitations on when it can be shown, but saying just basically trying to get it out there as much as they possibly can. Other filmmakers uh, will uh, request uh, some type of fee in order to help. Uh, make some money back because they've invested so much of their life and their savings or their investment into the film, and uh, and then uh, others have already signed away those uh, licensing fees to a third party, and now I need to negotiate with that third party in order to get their film, regardless of what how uh, uh, how much the filmmaker wants it to be in the film festival. I need it's the distributor's decision to make and uh, the terms and according to what they uh, decide, and that's not always in the filmmaker's best interest. Uh, I, at times I've actually gone to contact filmmakers when I'm when the distributor's been so disagreeable about how not disagreeable but have put together such a proposal that is astronomical that I can't believe that they're representing the filmmaker in a, a, a good way that uh, looks like you're going to say something Renee. Sorry. Uh, so whoa! Cool. I'm just freaking out because you're basically saying sometimes the distributor is actually uh, making decisions that aren't in the filmmaker's best interest. And my that's my my read on it. But who uh, and so this is a it's a very this is a very it's a people <laughs> business. Even though it's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, business uh, legal arrangements being set up, but it's still person to person, and that there's still a lot of interpretation about what your intentions are. If you really want this film to be included. Uh, put together a proposal that makes sense, and uh, so it's, it, it goes across the board. Okay, so, so can I ask Eugene, Eugene, why is being in a film festival so important or not from the filmmaker's point of view? Well, if you're going up for tenure, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very important because peer review is the way that we can integrate as Master of Fine Arts people into the Academy. Yeah. when you're sitting there on a college committee with biologists okay. and chemists, so that, but if I go back to the earliest parts of my career, the most important people for me have been curators. They're the ones that took a chance on me, um, and so I just have so much affection and respect for the process of curation. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. When I first started applying to Sundance in the early 90s, they were getting around 800 films a year in the category I was applying to. Now they're getting over 4,000. Wow. Wow. Okay, you know. so we really, so thank you for making this beautiful point that film festivals are curators in very similar ways to the way librarians are curators. Absolutely. And that is a fascinating place of synergy between the two groups working in their different contexts. Okay. Well, so just real quick, so a librarian could pick up the catalog from the Providence Children's Festival and use that as a starting point for purchasing decisions. We sure hope so. Yeah. <laughs> right? That, that's, yeah. But that's what happens, and that's why it's, that's another reason it's so important. Uh, Eugene, you have sussed out our ulterior motives, and <laughs> there you obviously... Go. We Didn't are, take long. We're, 25 well, minutes. There you go. We wear yeah. our hearts on our sleeves, don't we, Anissa? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, now let's turn to Katie because Katie, we need you to help us out with a lot of li librarians are have some anxiety about how the licensing process works, what the rules are, what they can and cannot do. Can you give us a kind of an overview of licensing from the public librarian's perspectives, especially a, a library. Um, you seem to have frozen up on me. You seem to have frozen up on me, so I'm not sure um, uh, I, if I'm interrupting. Um, but um, I'll go ahead and get started. Can you guys hear me at all? Okay, all right. So um, I uh, I feel like I'm like the wet blanket of this uh, gathering because I I I have to say that 
public libraries do need to have licenses or some form of permission to have public screenings of film and that is the intimidating part and that is the part that makes librarians nervous and unfortunately I can't say oh no don't worry about it um, so um, I, and I think it's also confusing for public libraries because um, there's confusing information out there because uh, there are different guidelines for classrooms, there are different guidelines for public, you know, for, sorry, for schools and universities um, who are allowed through the fair use guidelines to show a film in a classroom during face-to-face -face teaching without an additional license and that does not, that fair use of classroom teaching really doesn't carry over to public libraries, although sometimes there's, you know, confusion about that, um, since we often think of ourselves as somewhat educational in what we are doing. Um, and, uh, but the truth is, is that library, libraries are specifically listed in Title 17 of the Federal Copyright Act as places that need licenses to screen films. Um, and the main licenses that libraries are going to be dealing with are the public performance rights or a public performance umbrella license. Um, the main difference between the two forms of license is that a public performance rights come with the film. You essentially buy them when you buy the film. Um, while an umbrella license covers your location. Um, so I'm seeing you again. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, um, if you've ever shopped for, uh, when you shop for films with companies like Bullfrog, PBS Educational Media, a lot of those films come with the public performance rights. Um, these rights uh, generally include the right to show the film in a classroom, library, or free public screenings. Um, films with public performance rights are usually more expensive, sometimes a lot more expensive than the same film sold without the performance rights. But if you're only doing a few film screenings a year um, of very specific topics, um, it can be a really good choice to get a film with the public performance rights. Um, and uh, the other option, the common option for libraries, is the umbrella license. Now, with an umbrella license, you're, um, you're purchasing the license and renewing it annually from a company like Movie Licensing USA or the Motion Picture Licensing Company. Now, in this case, these companies go to the stu studios, to the filmmakers, they negotiate the rights to show, and then if you have the license, you can show films that are uh, part of the films that come from the studios that are covered by the license. Um, and the cost of these licenses are generally based on the population size of your community or number of card holders. Um, umbrella licenses offer you a lot more flexibility. Um, but you really need to be committed to showing multiple films a year. Um, the cost of an umbrella license doesn't make a lot of sense if you're only showing like one film a year or, you know. So, um, and then I think also what you can do, and a lot of librarians don't think of this, but I think is in keeping with the topics raised in this conversation is you can go directly to the vendor, to the studio, to the filmmaker. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't recommend trying this with Disney, but it can be very effective with small studios or independent filmmakers. Um, way, if I can oh. say, I mean, we, that's exactly what, what has happened in the past where we just go directly to, and they, and often they don't have a problem. They want to get their stories uh, told. They, they're thankful for being uh, in the loop. They're thankful for being, you know, uh, getting the film out there. But asking goes a long way, although I know librarians don't have the bandwidth to, you know, go search out every filmmaker or distributor, but it doesn't hurt to ask, and, uh, and, and often it pays off. So sorry to interrupt. 
Fascinating, no, that, fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Katie? Oh, I, I think in cases where like you have a local filmmaker or there's a film that's directly relevant to say your um, a lot of libraries have like the everybody reads the same book program once a year if there's a film that's really directly related and you really want to show it reaching out to the filmmakers can be very helpful um, it it doesn't always go well, it doesn't always work, but it, it can, you know, and I think a lot of, um, especially local filmmakers are excited about the thought of their, um, of their film being shown at the local library, you know, get them to come in and talk about it. It can be a really wonderful program. Eugene, um, have you ever had the experience of dealing directly with a library and is that what you want to do or do you yeah. to work with a middle, a middle man? I, I love working with libraries directly. They're very responsive. They ask great questions. They pay on time. You know, <laughs> like, you know, stuff like that where um, it's, it, it, it's just such a, it's always talked about, oh, your film could go, do well in education. That's where you're really going to recoup. That's where you get your audience. And, you know, I think what was being alluded to earlier with having difficulty dealing with distributors is that distributors want to pay for films to show at festivals. You know, that's kind of a long-running thing where, you know, if, if, if let's say you've got, you were nominated for an Academy Award for short documentary, you might get 30 or 40 festival invites. The distributor will go, well, that's $300 or $400 per festival we should charge. And so that's in, they see that as distribution income. You know, for filmmakers such as myself, I just see it as part of the mission of the movie. And, but the part that can have some return is dealing with the library directly. So I just sold a, uh, one of my short docs to um, LaSalle's library, and it was very easy, you know, and it was fast, and they told me how they were going to use it. We set a fee, and we ju and we just did it. So it was really interesting hearing the description of usage for everything. Our library at UNT just purchased uh, is working with Canopy Streaming. So we have now 15,000 titles, including the almost the entire Criterion collection, all the Bullfrog films, Kino Lorber, a lot of the really great distributors that students can use. We're actually looking at seriously for the first time ever starting online courses because of the amount of library uh, usage we have through streaming, which we would have never done in the past um, because of the quality of what's, what the library, and the library, they just went ahead and did it. They didn't ask us. They just, they're trying to redesign how they're going to be, you know, useful for programs like ours. Katie, that makes sense a lot, Eugene, for academic librarians that are supporting a film program. In the public library context, Katie, is uh, streaming part of the part of part of the mix for for you, or is the acquisition still mostly DVD uh, based? We do offer a streaming product to our patrons. Um, it's uh, Hoopla um, through um, Midwest Tapes, um, and there's um, it gets good a good amount of use. Um, and the other thing, just sort of related to the topic, is that um, we are allowed to show those uh, streaming videos in programs as long as they're made by studios that are covered by our license. Um, I had specifically contacted our licenses, uh, our umbrella license uh, managers to m make sure that was the case, um, but that was uh, happy news for us. We were glad um, to hear it. And uh, so that's, um, I, you know, I believe long term that's where the industry is going, obviously. As a selector, it's uh, challenging because uh, I do no selection for that. It's basically a, a product, we turn it on, and exciting for our patrons, our patrons essentially decide what they want to see, they choose. Uh, so, um, so, but it does, it does essentially take that selection out of the mix, um, and that selection is essentially 
what the company that provides your streaming service provides. What a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way, but in a way, in a way it shifts it the decision-making decision to a different uh, group of stakeholders. Renee, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to throw, I'll throw one in. Um, this is actually really for Anissa and Eric. Um, I'm just curious what you've seen in terms of um, people outside of maybe the local area that a film festival's held, like reaching out to festivals in other areas and seeing if maybe they can't partner with them still to get distribution. So maybe if they don't have a festival nearby, that they could still use that avenue. Sorry. You didn't able to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> put their microphone. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, ideally, the filmmakers call. When we're dealing with a film that's um, uh, a festival, festival, we limit our licensing, our licensing to a time period and to a number of uh, days and a number of screenings. So, oops, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Uh, say that again, uh, uh, Eric, because we were getting a little echo there, and, I, and we didn't really hear that. Um, it, and once, uh, it, it's a little bit difficult to uh, coordinate with outside of our community, our film festival community range, with, like, say, a library in Connecticut or something, just because uh, it, the, it's up to the filmmaker to figure out whether or not it comp they want to um, circuit their film there, if they want to have it shown there. We're licensed for a certain time period for a certain number of shows, and that's all. Uh, it's not an open-ended license where, oh, go find another place to show it, and we'll, you can show it there too. And it's like, we, of course, want to promote it and be a proponent of more, more shows, but uh, we're very limited about how we can yeah, show outside of our own festival time frame. It opens up... So, Eric, Eric, that's a really good point. So we can't be leaning on film festivals to do the exhibition licensing for us, right? As not librarians. necessarily for that. Uh, it's much more like uh, Eugene was say, uh, had alluded to. Basically, we're here to introduce the, a film, something you might not have known about, to be a resource, and then hopefully, if it's something of interest, then to be pursued by libraries. We're happy to help you know, do as much as we can, but um, uh, it's still, yes, the main thing is just bringing a film here to maybe introduce something that wasn't here before. Uh, okay, that, thank you very much for sharing that. Let's just see if you guys have any questions you want to ask each other, and then we're going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about best practices for film programming in public library contexts. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask, you want each, to ask other? each other? I have one for Katie. Um, I'm just curious, Katie, what's your experience with using um, movielicensing.com? Do you know the one that I'm talking about? Um, I actually I don't. don't. Um, you're teaching you're me something. Teaching me something. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's one we use a lot here in the public libraries, and I'm just curious because I hadn't heard it come up, and it's something that when we want to screen something, we usually go there. It's just www.movlic.com, and they have a stream for schools, which I don't know if that's as, as needed anymore, but then they also have a, screen, a stream for public libraries, and you can go through and see what has availability right now to sh if you want to show something for a program. Nice. So, so a little bit more than me. I was curious if you knew if, uh, what you thought of the validity of that. I'm but sorry. Back I'm sorry. To so, <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Uh, so, so Actually, that actually, is the movie, movie licensing USA, USA um, website. Um, website. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and, yes. so yes, so, we yes. use that. that, and in fact, and I encourage our uh, librarians to use that to check it before they contact me um, to ask if we can show something. Um, it's a great site. It really works well, and in fact. We actually have two umbrella licenses. We have the Movie Licensing USA, and then we have the um, MPLC, the Motion Picture Licensing Company, because we find they cover sort of a different spectrum 
um, but I'm constantly leaning on MPLC to make their website more um, useful and using the Moving Licensing USA um, site to do that. I, and I don't really mean to get into like a promoting like this licensing company is better than that licensing company. They provide a service, but um, I, I do appreciate the movie licensing website for how uh, friendly it is in helping librarians figure out what they can show. Um, and I will say the thing I always want to want to plug or try to plug is if you're not sure and you don't know and you have questions and you have an umbrella license or even if you don't call the companies call them ask them they want to help um, and I think sometimes I, I maybe this is just a personal thing sometimes we want to avoid talking to the vendors because we feel like they're just trying to sell us something you know we just don't want to talk to them but the fact is especially if we're if we have a license with them they're there to help us that's part of the money we pay them so use them what a nice what a sensible and nice thing so just as earlier we talked about go talk to the filmmaker Send the filmmaker an email if you want to work with the filmmaker directly. You're also saying, oh, by the way, the vendors are av available too and the licensing companies are, are able to help us in terms of uh, making good decisions as well. Uh, just one little detail I want to get in on the licensing front. Uh, this semester, the students in enrolled in my graduate class in film library education, we've been studying the history of how public libraries have been involved in the exhibition of Should we do questions for each other? I guess did Renee freeze. I think she's frozen at the moment. Okay. <laughs> so Lee, so, I don't Lee, think I don't think we've really heard from heard you from about what you're working on and maybe you could talk about your um, background and film programming that you're involved in. Just about myself. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I'm, I'm doing with film at the moment, since I've been so mired in StoryCorps, um, anything else is going with the uh, Children's Film Festival. So uh, that gets kicked a little bit over to Anissa and Eric's domain. And then we've been really lucky to partner with Rimosa as well um, as URI with making films with teens here. Um, and most recently we did a small teen film festival where we showed films that our kids had made and then we also looked at other local teen films and that was really like one of those things where we didn't have to do anything with licensing. This was all really in-house, uh, local media making and because they were movies that were made by our community um, and also by other teens, the kids had a lot to say about them which was a really cool way to engage them on talking about um, you know movie making or things that they want to aspire to do or what ideas they think are being conveyed and uh, um, I talked to Renee a little bit about this too, which I think there's that component of it's so interesting to talk to kids about how we read media. And also when they are media makers, how does that change the way that they look at media? So um, that's been a bigger discussion that we've been having here in Rhode Island um, as well with um, the Providence Children's Film Festival, which is how do we engage kids on learning to read media. And if you don't expose them to those conversations and you don't expose them to those films, they don't have an opportunity to do that. But you also, I think it's really important to stress how much you have to create a safe space for them to do that. That every idea is welcome at the table and not only from the staff but also with the other kids. And that it really is a sort of shared creative space. Hi, Renee, welcome back. Wow, thank you so much for making that great point. Um, it, it is a really interesting thing to think about how librarians support both the um, 
the critical consumption and the creative authorship dimensions of uh, of of making making media. And so, can, so I, I I assume that means you are smack dab in the middle about talking about best practices. Why don't we go around the room and talk a little bit about what are some of the following on Leah's great point? What are some best practices that you've discovered or or things you'd wish for in library programming uh, around film? Who wants to go first? Um, I can start. Um, oh. oh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear okay, you. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is um, libraries uh, using community partners to you know, help with their film programming and certainly reaching out to filmmakers, to studios, to film festivals is a way to go about that. Um, you can also use uh, community partners to help pay for your licenses if you're, uh, if you're, uh, don't have the budget but you have the desire to have, say, an umbrella license. There are ways to do that. There are ways to, um, uh, try and work and get sponsors for that sort of thing. Um, one program I'm really excited about that my system is doing is that we do have an annual uh, Everyone Reads the Same Book um, program um, and we've started partnering with a local independent movie theater that's very um, uh, successful in our area um, and uh, last year our book was the, or sorry, this spring, last spring, uh, was The Boys in the Boat, and <clears throat> which is about uh, the uh, rowing team that went to the 1936 Olympics, I can't remember the years, but the, the one that was held in Nazi Germany. And so we partnered with a local, that local um, movie theater uh, and called the Grand Cinema and we showed at the at their location a screening of Triumph of Will wow. and we had a professor from the university come and give an introduction and discuss it it was like on a it was a beautiful day it was a Wednesday evening and uh, the house was packed we were shocked because people out here in the Northwest don't go inside if it's nice out you know <laughs> Um, and we're planning another program again this year and they're, the movie theater is very excited to work with us, we're excited to work with them and it's just another way to get the library out there and involved. Boy, that's a great example of an effective kind of partnership. Partnerships are so important for building film library programs. What other best practices or dreams or wishes do you hope for as you think about the future of film programming in the public library context? Um, I, I can go on that. I mean, you know, one of the things that I would love to have is the secret list of all the libraries and the contact person there and it can make this wonderful email list because one of the things that's come out of the research about audience engagement is that email is still considered the best way to reach people. Right. Um, because, you know, as we're seeing with the rise and fall and the rise and fall of social media like Twitter and Facebook is becoming, evolving into this other thing, which I, I just started following Mark Zuckerberg and I don't know what the guy is doing. I mean, you know, but in terms of getting people to engage in a deeper way, it's through email. And so, you know, some, without having to, for an independent filmmaker to, to purchase it somehow or have it be a secret. Are there, or making 2,000 phone calls to get the information, you know? And then that could be part of your distribution plan is to build this package and have it, and then just with one button you can get your message out, and then you can have a series of appropriate follow ups and conversations. And I, you can. I, I love this idea, Eugene, and I love the idea of increasing the a sense of connectedness between independent filmmakers and librarians. So there's yeah. lots of ways to do that. Email is one way. A, um, ALA annual and midwinter and programming mm -hmm. uh, at, at the conferences where 
you're going to get 15,000 librarians in one, yeah. in one place, right, twice a year. Um, so I like the idea of relationship building in mm -hmm. ways that digital media and um, and face-to-face -face media can really support. Yeah. Um, so de definitely we need to uh, continue to find ways to deepen those relationships. Uh, Eric and Anissa, uh, ideas or dreams about best practices for um, uh, library programming from, my, from your point of view? My, my, uh, one of the things I, uh, we got cut off I, uh, was that um, I'd like to just in a macro way change the perception of some librarians and uh, Leah and Katie are not the exception of, are not the example of this but seeing uh, films as a distraction from the books like I'm a huge fan of books and it's, it's their storytelling they're, they uh, they never want to get off the mission of a library being a a, a book place however uh, changing the perception of making it not an entertainment vehicle but rather a storytelling vehicle and, uh, and a powerful one at that, that complements uh, a book collection rather than competes against one. Um, that's one of my uh, wishes because sometimes I encounter that talking to people and, the, and the, they see it as an entertainment vehicle and not as a, uh, uh, something to complement. And I would just add to that one of the things that we think about is, you know, not all media is bad. You know, kids are consuming a lot of media these days, but it's not all bad. And so going back to the curation of the films that we do from the festival is that we pride ourselves in the films that we select. And as it was spoken earlier, is that we want people to peruse what we've shown in the past so that synergy between the libraries of using us as a resource for all the work that Eric has done in programming and working with our jurors, young and old, of putting together an amazing selection of films every year that the libraries can use us as a resource and that we want to provide opportunities for quality films that the libraries can then take and go on with their own programming. So we think that that's really important. Wow. So, uh, Leah, Renee, can we'll I, let you, uh, yeah, we'll let you have the last one, really Leah. Oh, gosh, stop. <laughs> no, I just really wanted to say, you know, this is, I know this is kind of a boring conversation to sometimes revisit, which is licensing and libraries and how do we do this, but I think it's so, it has such a bigger importance and the bigger piece is, is that if we don't do this work that is sometimes hard and sometimes difficult and sometimes pushes us in, in areas that we don't feel like thinking about, we, we cannot give access to so much of our community and I think that that's the biggest thing that is my dream is that we have so many kids that come to our libraries here in Providence that would never have these experiences, would never have access, would never see these movies or be exposed to making films. And if we don't do the hard work of figuring out how to crack the licensing code and how to get these programs in there, our community is not going to have access. And that's why I think, I, I feel it's so important to do this work and, and why, uh, that's, that's my bigger dream is that we will all work together and give as much access to our communities as possible. I can't think of I a better way to conclude the program. Um, I, do, I, I do want to. Um, I do want to try to do a quick and dirty summary, and um, so let's uh, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about what we accomplished today. Today we've we've heard from some amazing uh, filmmakers, film festival organizers, and librarians about issues related to film exhibition and licensing in public library. We asked a bunch of different questions to understand the economics of how filmmakers uh, make money and how film festivals screen films and what constitutes the lawful use of film exhibition in libraries and what are the best practices in libraries for exhibition and why does it matter. And here's what we learned. We learned that independent filmmakers make money by selling the rights to exhibit their films. They use film festivals and film distribution services, and they market independently. And filmmakers pay a small fee to enter their films into the film festivals, and that helps film festivals promote and market the film. We learned a lot about public exhibition licensing, and that licensing process includes two different kinds of uh, licenses, public performance rights, which come with the film when you purchase it or rent it, and public performance licenses, or sometimes they're called site licenses, that are location-specific, one-time-only kind of events. Licenses may limit how you can promote the film to a general audience. Maybe in some licenses you can't use the film name or the name of the actor or the name of the director. Licenses may also limit whether you can sell tickets or not. 
And there are two main licensing companies that supply licensing to libraries and other organizations. Finally, we talked about best practices in library film programming and how important it is that they be sensitive to the diverse needs of their patrons and recognizing that children and young people can learn to read and write using, oh my goodness, let's spell it correctly, ladies and gentlemen, film and video. And that successful programs can be designed to entertain, to inform, to educate, and inspire. We talked about the importance of partnerships with community organizations to support and sponsor film programs, helping increase the visibility and relevance of the public library. And we heard some really good stories about that. And we recognize that film programs take time to develop, that consistency is important in building patron awareness of film programming. So with that, I'd like to thank my special guests for today, Leah Loveman of the Providence Community Library, Katie Irons of the, ah, <laughs> Katie out there in Washington, D.C. She's the Pierce County. Pierce County Library, and in, it's Washington State. Washington State, thank you so much. Uh, Eugene Martin, filmmaker extraordinaire from Denton, Texas. And finally, uh, my partner in crime, Anissa Rauf, executive director of the Providence Children's Film Festival, and her partner in crime, the amazing, talented Eric Bilodeau. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you are inspired to do some film programming in library. And if you do, like, let us know, all right? Thanks again. I'm Renee Hobbs at the Harrington School of Communication and Media and the Media Education Lab. Hope you join us for another webinar soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.